Hello, everyone, and welcome to this uh, global immunotalk series. This is the first talk in the series. I'm really glad to be here today and to begin the series. I'm Asia Rolls, and I'm joining this program that uh, has been running for several years now, run by Elena and Carla. And uh, thank you, Fuzia, for helping with this program as well. And uh, as the idea is to open these talks to everyone, they are recorded and uh, will allow immunology to be more globalized and accessible. And it's my great, great pleasure <laughs> to introduce the first speaker of this series today, uh, Professor Michal Schwartz. And it is especially an honor for me because Michal has been my mentor, my PhD advisor. And uh, I think uh, in terms of the spirit of these talks, when the meaning of a mentor for life is something that uh, I was very lucky to have uh, when Michal is my PhD advisor and mentor. Uh, Michal basically transformed, made, she, she's one of those scientists that made a transformation in the way we think about a problem, about a big problem. And in the context of immunology, she took the idea of autoimmunity and its relationship and the activity of immune cells and how they function in their relationship with the brain and the nervous system and actually transformed the dogma. And in 99, when she coined the concept of protective autoimmunity, this was breaking all kind of concepts when the way we thought of autoimmunity was only as something that is detrimental. And just using the word of protective autoimmunity, I think was thought provoking. And since then, she kind of proved her concept in so many ways, in so many directions and opened a whole field of research for all of us. And this was a, a work of many years. And uh, of course it was recognized with many awards, including recently the Israel prize. She got two advanced ERC, for those who, of us who know this system, know it's very, very hard. She has an exceptional uh, age index of 119, which is uh, reflects on how impactful her work is. She has, uh, she, she's been really, uh, the, the, created a whole generation of uh, researchers, uh, from her lab, including 15 professors that came out of her lab. She started companies and her most recent company is uh, working in a, she is now in, the, in a clinical trial for Alzheimer's, trying to benefit the advantage of, I think all the years of her understanding and the concepts that she, that she developed and applying it to, uh, to the field of neuroscience and, uh, and neurodegenerative disease. So uh, in the spirit of this program, and especially in the spirit of mentoring, uh, I would like to ask Michal a question. If she will open the camera, I can even uh, ask the question. Hi, Michal. Hi. <laughs> so Thank we you. are... Oh, sorry, <laughs> it's glad to have you here. And uh, part of the, the series is that we are asking a question, a personal question. And in your case, it would be, what would you do differently if you were to start your lab again? What is the advice you would do? Uh, waste less time on fighting against my opponents. I, all my life, I continue to search for the tool, scientific tools and I took too seriously my opponents and it took much energy for me and much time and it was emotionally very suffering. With my knowledge now, I recommend any student, if you come across an idea or observation that it's unexpected, keep on doing the hard work. You will face opposition, but you will overcome it. I think there is no better example than you to proving that this is the way to go. So without further ado, I will please share your uh, presentation. We will hear Michal's talk. And then, uh, as you know, in the end of that, you will be able to ask your questions on X and not directly online. Uh, so you will be able to continue the conversation with Michal 
uh, online later on. So please, Michal. Can, can you see my screen? Yes, we can. Just make it on uh, yeah. presenter mode. I will do it in a minute. All right. So thank you, Asya, for the introduction. And the title of my talk today is The Immune System Protects the LC Mind is Amenable to Restoration by Immunotherapy to Defeat Aging and Dementia. Uh, since I know that many of the audience are uh, students, I build the talk in a way that I will go step by step showing you how we build the new dogma. So just as a disclaimer, I am Chief Scientific Officer of Immunobrain Checkpoint, a biopharma that is currently developing immunotherapy to defeat Alzheimer's disease. So the topics that I'm going to cover today are the following. First, I will share with you the transformed understanding of our current, of our current understanding of the brain immune relationship. Then I'll tell you what are the implications to brain aging and diseases basically for us is the loss of brain immune communication. Then I'll show you our repro proposed approach of immunotherapy to defeat Alzheimer's disease, data supporting the underlying mechanism, and suggest that we know that Alzheimer's disease is long lived in the body, it's dormant for many years, so it's asymptomatic. And we believe based on our data and other people now data that immune dysregulation is the transition from asymptomatic to symptomatic. And then I'll share with you some data related to the translation. So the transform understanding of brain immunity is following the, no, the common knowledge. It was known for decades that the brain is a behind barrier collectively known as the blood brain barrier. This was discovered first by Paul R. Ehrlich, for which he got a Nobel Prize in 1908. Another layer that we, we knew for decades that the brain is immune privilege. This was coined by Peter Medora. When he injected foreign tissue to the brain or to the eye, it was highly rejected. Based on this, he coined the idea the brain and the eye are immune privilege. The interpretation of the community for many years are based on the blood-brain barrier and the idea that the brain is immune privilege, that the brain cannot tolerate any immune activity. And the interpretation was that if you see any immune activity in the brain, it's a sign of inflammation that should be suppressed. As you probably know, or if you don't know, between the brain and the circulation, there are three types of barriers. There is the barrier that we all know, which is the blood-brain barrier. Indeed, it's a barrier. Uh, it's a complete barrier. But there are two additional barriers that were relatively ignored in terms of our relationship with the immune system. One of which is the meninges, and the other is the blood cerebrospinal fluid barrier, the barrier between the blood vessels and the fluid in which the brain is floating. So based on uh, Paul Ehrlich data and P Peter Medawa, for decades, no one tried to re-challenge this idea. Uh, over the last 26 years, uh, my team uh, initiated a new field that we now call Transform Understanding of Brain Immunity, which was summarized by us in 2023 in Science where we show for the first time a very comprehensive discussion how the, the, uh, the change in the immune understanding of the relationship between the brain and the immune system we now understand. And briefly, we now know that the brain is not only not isolated from the immune system, but there are immune cells that are sitting at the brain's border and the two type of borders, the blood cerebrospinal fluid barrier and the meninges. And so unlike the dogma that prevailed that it's completely isolated, the privilege of the brain is to have immune cells at its border. The brain control these immune cells and has the privilege to tell these immune cells, I need you, help me. And if I, not, I don't need you, I'll keep you separate in this, this district uh, 
uh, uh, niches. In addition, we now know through the work of Jonathan Kipnis and uh, several others that the there is a lymphatic system that drains the brain to the deep cervical to the cervical lymph node. So there is a complete immune system that equips the brain with the ability to take advantage of these immune cells and they are in the brain access accessible to the brain. So from idea that the brain is isolated from the immune system, we now know that there is a bi-directional relationship between the brain and the immune system. So the brain, the fact that brain innervate uh, all, all, all immune organ was known for decades, but the other way around, the connection between the lymphoid organ and the brain or between immune cells in the brain was completely ignored. And it was summarized very elegantly uh, in 2022 by a journalist in uh, a nature journalist. She called for the first time the immune cells as the guardian of the brain as opposed to the immune isolation of the brain isolation from the immune system. So we propose now after so many years of working that the brain together with the immune cells and it and in its borders, and as I said, the borders are the meninges, the blood cerebrospinal fluid barrier. So these immune cells together with the lymphatic vessels and the immune, the lymphoid organ are creating an ecosystem that increase the brain resilience and robustness to any perturbation. It was uh, decided by the neuron editor to take this cartoon of the bi-directional relationship between the brain and the immune system. And this uh, idea that there is a synergy and communication between the brain and the cells that reside in this territory, we call it ecosystem. And the editor decided to, to translate our suggestion to a forest with the fungus. So overall, this is the new understanding of the brain uh, relationship with the immune system, that the brain needs immune cells, it has the immune cells accessible in its border, and it communicates with them. So all of this uh, started in 1998, when my team showed for the first time that blood-borne macrophages are needed for central nervous system repair. Keep in mind that in the brain, 10% of the cells are myeloid cells. These are microglia, shown by um, Miriam Arad that these are, are cells that get into the brain early during development from the yolk sac, and these cells are not replaced by blood-borne mac macrophages. But since there are 10% of the cells in the central nervous system, everyone believed for decades that there is no need for extra immune cells. So we found that following injury, uh, uh, there is a need for blood-borne macrophages, and there is also need for T cell. And specifically, as Asya said, we need T cell that recognize brain antigen, and we coined the idea of protective autoimmunity. So these two publications in 1998 and 1999 in Nature Medicine were indeed very provocative, and it took several years to support our idea and to repeat them. Subsequently, we found that these monocytes-derived macrophages are displaying locally at the site of injury anti-inflammatory role. Uh, but I think that the major transition in the concept that the brain needs immune cells came from this work with Jonathan Kipnis and Yaniv Ziv and Nogaron were in my laboratory. All of them are professor, independent professor and very successful. And we demonstrated for the first time that immune cells such as T cell or CD4 T cell recognizing brain antigen are not just needed for supporting repair, but are a fundamental player in healthy brain plasticity. In other words, if you take young animals that are um, immune compromised, either skid or nude, their performance, cognitive performance will be um, impaired. And we coined the idea that immune uh, brain plasticity is dependent on adaptive immunity. Since it's an old data, I just want to share with you one slide. 
if you take animal and put them in a cage, which is uh, we call collectively as enriched environment because they have a good social life, they can do sport activity. You can see increased neurogenesis, which was published long before our work. And you can see in the hippocampus when you la label for newly formed neurons, you can see them very nicely. If you place in the same cage immune compromised mice, you don't see this increased neurogenesis. Likewise, if you take LC animal and uh, monitor their spatial learning and memory in a, a pool of water, uh, and you introduce them to the pool and they desperately want to escape. So if they step on the platform that they initially don't see it, uh, they learn the position of the platform relative to picture around the pool. If you keep pl placing them in the pool, they will find the platform. When you put skid mice, they will never learn and remember the position of the platform. So immune compromised animal suffering from cognitive impairment. And we thought that the idea that the brain aging doesn't necessarily reflect chronological aging, but more so immunological aging, and we will touch upon it. Subsequently, several other groups repeated our work and demonstrated that mental health is also dependent on the integrity of the immune system, social behavior, cognitive behavior, ability to recover from acute injury, ability to cope with any mental stress, neurodevelopmental diseases, neurodegenerative diseases, and even pregnancy can dampen neurogenesis, and we demonstrated several years ago. And of course, aging of the brain. So what are the implications of this finding to brain aging, and, um, a, and what are the implications of brain immune communication to aging of the, the brain in general? So uh, following our discovery that LC brain plasticity is dependent on the immune system, we were struggling to find out how does it happen because there are very little, uh, um, small number of uh, T cell in the brain tissue itself. So we envision that probably the T cell that affect the brain, they are affecting remotely from the barium. So my team uh, found a T cell in the blood cerebrospinal fluid barrier between the blood vessels and the epithelial layer that formed the blood cerebrospinal fluid barrier. And Jonathan Kipnis, who was by, by then independent investigator, found them in the meninges. What both of us group have found that the majority of these T cell are memory T cell. And then we specifically found that in the uh, stroma between the blood vessel and the epithelial layer, the majority are memory T cell that locally can produce interferon gamma, IL-4, and IL-10. These are the T cell that you can find here in the stroma, this little spot. Uh, we wanted then to see what are the implications to aging. So uh, in 2014, together with Ido Amit at the Weizmann Institute, we decided to check whether aging of the brain is affected by the aging of of the immune system by the aging of the interface of the communication between the brain and the circulation or by the brain itself. So we did robust RNA sec of 11 tissue in, from young and old animals. To make a long story short, we discover that there was one signal, a, a very a strong signal that distinguished very strongly between LC brain, young brain, and uh, age brain without any neurological diseases, just aging. And we found at the choroid plexus, this epithelial layer, type one elevation of type one interferon. When we took human section from post-mortem uh, brain section from Oxford uh, uh, University Bank, we found the same phenomena, strong type one interferon in old people, but in, not in young people, and none of these old people had any neurological disease. We also found that there is also a reduction in signaling that coming from the periphery interferon gamma signaling. So there was down regulation of type one, up regulation of type one interferon in the choroid plexus epithelium, the interface between the brain and the circulation. 
when we neutralize type 1 interferon uh, in this epithelial layer, we found that we changed the phenotype of the microglia, the brain resident immune cells. And not only that, we found that the majority of genes that are upregulated in aged microglia are type 1 rela relations. So overall, what we found that aging of the brain is affected very much by aging of this epithelial layer. We found that this type 1 interferon is induced by inflammatory cytokines that are, flow, are coming from the brain via the CSF, and it impacts the signature of the microglia. This was lately repeated by other group, and they found the same phenomena also in Alzheimer. What is also interesting that this microglia in aging are down-regulated with respect to MEF2C, which is the transcription factor that help coping with inflammation. And the same was found also in Alzheimer's. In other words, aging of the brain is associated with type 1 interference signature, chronic elevation of type 1 interference in the choroid plexus, which affect remotely the microglia. As a result of it, the microglia upregulate genes that impaired cognition and down-regulating MEF2C, which is a transcription factor that help coping with inflammation. Uh, uh, in, in late COVID-19 patients that died uh, with cognitive impairment, there was a work that was done by Tony Weiskuri that showed the same phenomena, the type 1 interferon elevation in the choroid plexus is associated with cognitive impairment in those patients that died out of COVID with cognitive impairment. And lately we found that this type of interferon at the brain choroid plexus epithelium, which is the epithelial layer between the CSF and the blood vessels, uh, it's common to all neurodegenerative diseases. Uh, we took data, available data for Huntington disease, for frontal temporal dementia, Alzheimer, uh, in the, all of those cases, we saw the uh, upregulation of type 1 interferon, which dampening the function of the brain. So what are the implications to Alzheimer uh, disease? Uh, so we thought that the best way to target Alzheimer is to target the brain immune communication, and I'll explain it in a few minutes. So what do we know about Alzheimer's disease? We know that it's a debilitating disease. We know that there is a long asymptomatic period which can take 10 to 20 years. We know that only five or 10% of the cases are uh, familiar, the rest are sporadic. We know that the major risk factor is aging. It's also affected by environmental factors such as nutrition, uh, pollution and lifestyle. We know that the disease is very heterogeneous among patients. It's dynamic, multifaceted, multi-stages. And we know that it's accumulation with waste, uh, of, uh, uh, waste such as amyloid beta, oligomer, plaques, tangles, and dead cells. There is also chronic local inflammation. For decades, the community uh, working on Alzheimer, both clinicians and scientists, were focusing on reducing or preventing plaque formation. And the success is relative, only lately there is some success. Uh, there is a good success, su uh, success in re reducing plaque uh, accumulation, but the effect on cognitive improve improvement is still limited. Uh, there was, uh, in 2018, editor of Nature Medicine invited four of us to ask us what we think is the best way to fight against Alzheimer's. Uh, some, of, uh, some of the scientists still claim that we should focus amyloid beta. In the ideal world, is a combination therapy if you can, we can identify all possible factors that contribute to disease. I suggested to focus on the immune system based on our understanding. So what we learned uh, much after we started with our approach is that indeed the major factor that contributes to cognitive loss is the local brain inflammation. So the accumulation of plaque can cause some cognitive loss, 
we know that the accumulation the, uh, of uh, uh, neurofibrillary tangles cause some cognitive loss, but only when in inflammation add to this, we see robust cognitive loss. So local brain inflammation is a key factor. Over the years, since we published that bone marrow derived macrophages are needed for brain repair, there were numerous uh, work showing that in animal model, transgenic animal model of Alzheimer, if you manage to uh, bring to the brain more monocytes derived macrophages, you can decrease disease severity. So taking all of that together, we envision that maybe we should find a way to bring more monocytes to the brain. We, uh, in our previous work, we showed that monocytes indeed can get access to the brain via the blood cerebrospinal fluid barrier if this epithelial layer is exposed to interferon gamma coming from the blood vessels and sense inflammatory cytokine coming through the CSF. So we envision that maybe activation of the choroid plexus or restoring the communication between the brain and the immune system could be a way to fight Alzheimer's disease. Just to show you that if you culture epithelial cells that form the, blood, the barrier between the CSF and the blood vessels, and you expose them to cytokines that come from the brain, such as TNF alpha or IL-1 beta, and a cytokine that coming from the T cell, which could be interferon gamma, IL-10 or IL-4, we found that expression of leukocytes, trafficking molecules such as cell adhesion molecule and chemokine are very much dependent on the synergy between TNF alpha and uh, TNF alpha and IL-1 beta um, and interferon gamma or IL-1 beta and interferon gamma. So interferon gamma in the periphery seems to be an important uh, stimulator of the communication between the brain and the immune system. Indeed, in animal model of Alzheimer, we found that there is loss of interferon gamma in the circulation at early stage of the disease before cognitive loss in this specific um, animal colony, we see cognitive loss at six months and already at four months, we see reduction in interferon gamma. And we see also elevation of su uh, suppressors. Independent work published uh, several years ago in PNAS showed that if you breed Alzheimer mice with skid mice, the disease is more severe. And another group showed that in animal model other than the one that we used for Alzheimer's disease, J20, they found the same phenomena, loss of interferon gamma and reduction in expression of cell adhesion molecule by the choroid plexus. Also uh, last year, it was published by the group in Harvard by Tanzi Rudi, that a uh, disease progression is faster when the animal, when patients are losing interferon gamma. In other words, when the interferon gamma level are higher, the disease progression is lower, slower. So overall, the impression from our work in animal model and in human, that high level of circulating interferon gamma can de delay a disease progression, and from our work, then can support recruitment of monocytes. So there are several ways that we, we did over the years to boost communication between the brain and the circulation or to boost immunity. And one of which is removal, uh, transiently removal of regulatory T cell, which we found it's very efficient in Alzheimer's disease model. Although we need regulatory T cell in the brain, we need to reduce them as, uh, as transiently in the circulation. But based on our understanding of what is needed to boost interferon gamma in the circulation and the need to activate the communication between the brain and the circulation, we decided uh, to try to see if the use of immune checkpoint will be beneficial. So we envision using anti-PD-1 uh, PD, uh, PD or anti-PD-L1. We checked also in our early study, also TIM3 and CTLA4. The idea was that if we uncouple the communication between CD4 T cell expressing PD-1 and PDL one we can uh, boost interferon gamma in the circulation. 
keep in mind, we knew that PDL1 can be expressed by epithelial cells, Treg, and antigen presenting cells. Right now, we, we, there are other cells that present, express PD1 and PDL1. So our first study, we use anti-PD1, and subsequently we move to anti-PDL1. For cognitive uh, um, uh, assessment, we use uh, the, again the pool of water with six arm. In one arm, there is a platform. The animal don't see the platform when you put them into the at the pool. They are around picture, and we monitor the number of errors that the animal are making before they learn uh, to swim directly to the platform. So this is just an illustration. Wild type animal learned very nicely. It's a maze of a test over two days, in each day five times. Uh, and you can see nicely that this is learning curve over two, uh, the sec first day and second day of wild type animal. Um, Alzheimer animal don't learn and don't remember. So what we did, we uh, injected anti-PD-1. We saw upregulation of CCL2 and CXL10 by the choroid plexus epithelium. And with a, this was very transiently, but with a delay between three and four weeks, we saw improvement of cognitive ability. This is just one example. So one month after the injection of anti-PD-1, uh, the red show you the Alzheimer animal, uh, the black show you healthy animal, the gray show you uh, animal treated with uh, irrelevant antigen, uh, antibody, IgG control, and anti-PD-1, these are the green, so you can see that the animal uh, learn and remember very nicely. <coughs> we repeated the work with anti-PD-L1, and this is a dose dependency. So you can see these are the LC animal are the black, the red are the anti the uh, control the animals, the Alzheimer animal, uh, the the light red are the ones treated with IgG control, and these are uh, with uh, not with IgG control, and these are anti PD1, uh, anti PDL1 at 0.5 and 1.5. So overall, we see a dose dependency. So this is anti-PDL1, 0.1, 0.5, and 1.5. So overall, you can see that there is a dose dependency, and but we reach a plateau very early. Uh, we wanted to see whether we can reverse cognitive loss at the early stage. So these are animals that were treated at five months and uh, were tested at five months, the time that we knew that it's early, but complete cognitive loss, but very early. So we check, we took, sorry, we took a big cohort of mice, uh, uh, Alzheimer mice at the five, at five, 5.5 months. Uh, we measured them and you see cognitive impairment. And then we separated them into two groups. One group received IgG control and one group received anti-PDL1. And you can see that those that receive anti-PDL1, there was some reversal of the cognitive loss. We continue to see what other aspect of the disease we are affecting by the anti-PDL1. So we stand for marker of synapses and we saw reduction uh, in, uh, 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 so we see improvement in synaptophysin. And we see also improvement in, uh, in neuronal loss. So overall, we have some effect on synaptic markers, and we have rescue of neurons. We continue to see whether we are affecting accumulation of amyloid beta, and we took um, we measured by ELISA soluble and insoluble amyloid beta. And we see reduction on both soluble and insoluble amyloid beta. Because we envision that the effect is on the immune system, we consider that it could affect other type of dementia. So we took two additional mouse model of uh, dementia, uh, both of them a model of hyperphosphorylation of tau, Tau is, uh, is microtubule associate protein. It stabilizes the microtubule that are needed, that are the uh, infrastructure of neuron. 
So uh, when there are hyperphosphorylation, the neuron are collapsing and dying. So uh, we took two mouse model of hyperphosphorylation of tau, and here we are measuring short-term memory. So we put the animal into a maze. In this maze is a tau maze. So one arm is closed, and we allow the animal to learn the, the maze. And the, then we open the, the third arm. If the animal learn and remember, they have a preference. So white type animal have a preference, sick animal no preference, and then the same dose dependency. So regardless of the type of the uh, pathology or the primary cause of the disease, we see that anti pdl one is effective. I should emphasize the CTL4 didn't have any effect, and TIMS3 had a similar effect to PDL1. We monitor, we measure also level of inflammatory cytokine, and we found that there is a reduction of inflammatory cytokine both by PCR and by ELISA, we measure IL-1 beta. And we saw very nice correlation between cognitive performance and IL-1 beta. The lower the IL-1 beta, the best cognitive performance. So our effect on cognition seems to be reduction of inflammatory. In a model of taopathy, uh, we, we again, we measure behavior and we see the same effect. This is another model of taopathy. We see effect on behavior. We see reduction of a level of phosphotau in the brain. And here it was interesting because we also collected CSF and we measure tau. Tau is a measure in clinic for neuronal death, and we see nice correlation between reduction in total tau in the CSF and hyperphosphorylation of tau in the brain. Overall, this was repeated by us in many other models and by others, and in all cases, we see reduction of inflammation, and in those cases where it checked, we see a rescue of neurons. So the question is, what is the underlying mechanism? So as I said, the treatment is a single injection in these cases, and we see improvement of cognition with a delay, and the clearance of the antibody is about a week after the injection of the antibody. So we envision that what affects the brain is not necessarily the antibody, but probably we are in, uh, allowing or facilitating mono monocytes roaming to the brain. To test this working hypothesis, we made use of antibody directed to CCR2. CCR2 receptor is expressed by monocytes, and this is the way that their egress from the bone marrow and get to the tissue. So using anti-CCR2 antibody, we abrogated completely the effect on cognition uh, in the model of taopathy, and we lost completely beneficial effect tested by uh, special memory and working memory. We also tested to see whether we are losing the effect on aggregation of tau, and we saw again, we are losing the effect on the pathology. So there is reduction in the aggregation of protein. And when we treat the antibody, it was blocked um, monocytes, we are losing it completely. And the same also with respect to neuronal survival. We saw that with the anti pdl one we are indeed also reducing the local brain inflammation. We checked a TNF-alpha, IL-1-beta, IL-6, IL-12, PSRT, uh, and when we blocked the monocytes, we blocked the, we lost the effect on inflammation. So the question was, in, uh, in addition to the monocyte, we saw that the treatment facilitated arming of regulatory tissue which was lately repeated by the work of Dave Altman in St. Louis, and he found regulatory T cell in the brain. So it's not om only oming of monocytes, but also oming of regulatory T cell, the oming of which we are losing when we block the CCR2. So what might be the underlying mechanism? Independent work was published last year uh, in aging of animal, they use uh, they block PD1, PD1 and PDL1, and they found that in all tested tissue in aging, there was reduction of senescent cells. Other work showed that PD1 are uh, affecting also recovery from brain trauma, but they think that the effect is inside the brain. So what might be what the monocytes bring that the microglia cannot do? 
So to this end, uh, several years ago, together with Ido Amit, we found that in mouse model of Alzheimer, microglia are activated in a TREM2 dependent pathway. TREM2 is um, a molecule that are expressed by all myeloid cells, including microglia and monocytes outside the brain. So we found that it's TREM2 dependent and the TREM2 activated microglia are surrounding the plugs and limited the spread of the plugs. So uh, we wanted to see what the microglia monocytes are bringing to the brain that the microglia cannot do. So to this end, we sorted CD45 high CD11BI amyloid cells that include activated microglia and in infiltrating monocytes to the brain. And by single cell RNA sequencing, we saw that the monocytes are expressing molecules that are not expressed by microglia. They have overall profile of anti-inflammatory, but one molecule which was very, very um, uh, intriguing is MSR1, it's macrophage scavenger receptor one, that we saw that it's elevated by the monocytes, a derived macrophages and not by microglia, and independent work published by uh, El Khoury several years ago, they found in vitro the scavenger receptor expressed by macrophages can remove amyloid beta. So we were intrigued by this. Now we know that this uh, our scavenger receptor recognized damage associated pattern. We repeated it in other model of Alzheimer and we found the same phenomena. So it doesn't matter if it's theopathy or amyloidosis, elevation of uh, MSR1 expressed by monocytes and not by microglia and its scavenger receptor. So we created um, um, mice that, with dementia where we uh, replaced the bone marrow with bone marrow taken from MSR1 knockout mice. We protect the head to make sure that we are not affecting the microglia. And we found that when we have uh, Alzheimer mice with bone marrow from wild type, they continue to respond to anti pdl one but Alzheimer mice that receive uh, bone marrow from MSR1 stop to re respond to it. So overall, we learn that ma macrophages are needed, and specifically, one of the scavenger receptors that expressed by macrophages, not by microglia, is extremely important. Then we took micro uh, animal that don't express TREM2. And uh, Alzheimer animal that don't express TREM2, uh, we wanted to see whether anti pdl one can overcome the deficiency in TREM2. And what we found that indeed it can, you can see that both TREM2 positive and TREM2 negative Alzheimer mice responded to the anti pdl one And again, that the effect was um, a monocytes dependent. So overall, anti pdl one bring, help bringing to the brain monocytes and TREG. The monocytes are affecting multiple process. We still don't know uh, to what extent. We have some idea that the microglia and macrophages are cross-talking, but basically the monocytes can uh, overcome or bypass TREM2 deficiency. Lately, we found that the microglia that express TREM2 are not only good, there is a subpopulation of microglia that are senescence microglia and also express high level of TREM2, which put this question mark to what extent was the disease progression TREM2 was beneficial, because at the early stage, we see TREM2 expressing microglia around plaques, but then when we monitor TREM, uh, when we search for TREM uh, for senescences in the, in the brain of Alzheimer, aging, and theopathy, in all of them, we saw a common signature of uh, senescence. All of them express TREM2. And the signature of TREM2 expressing senescences and TREM2 expressing microglia, activated microglia, are distinctive. So they are not the same cells and it's not the same trajectory. And to prove this, we uh, treated Alzheimer mice with senolytic drug and we found reduction in senescent cells. We also took TREM to knock out Alzheimer mice and we found lower level of senescent cells. So overall, uh, TREM2 activated microglia are beneficial at early stage. They are 
probably not uniform. At the late stage, there is accumulation of TREM2 senescences that are destructive. So treatment via TREM2 could be um, very challenging. But anti pdl one can overcome both the TREM2 deficient and the TREM2 positive. So what we believe is what we now believe that the, um, the transition from dormant cells to the uh, symptomatic is when the immune system dysfunctioning. So for decades, we knew that there is plaque for many years. We know that removal of plaque is not sufficient. Now, based on our discovery, and for which we have uh, data, but it's beyond the scope of my presentation today, that if we intentionally impaired the systemic immune system by high level of regulatory T cell or any other mechanism, we uh, can push the disease manifestation to early stage. So, so immune functioning is critical to contain the disease. As soon as the immune is dysfunctioning, the dormant disease can become symptomatic. So this is the cartoon that summarizes what we uh, what I've shown you so far, and I'll show you in a few minutes where are with the translation. So basically what I've shown you so far, that with anti-PD-1 or anti-PDL-1, we need short exposure to the antibody. And then there was a delay, there is effect on the brain. The effect on the brain is mediated uh, at least in part by monocytes derived macrophages coming to the brain. We still don't know uh, how many of the macrophages are. Uh, we see few of them in the parenchyma, but in all of our, our tests, we took the entire brain. So the owning macrophages can be the border, can be in the meninges, at the, the choroid plexus, but we see some of them in the brain. We have an, an indication that there is a crosstalk between the microglia and macrophages, but we still need to further establish it. And what the beauty is that within the brain, we see effect on multiple factor. Q1 is reduction of inflammation. We see rescue of neurons. We see rescue of pathology, but we believe that mostly is an outcome of the reduced uh, inflammation. Uh, based on this understanding, uh, the, we founded the company in 2016. The company took the idea of the anti pdl one uh, or the checkpoint based on the understanding of the mechanism of action, we learned first we proposed the disease, the Alzheimer's disease is not only brain centric disease, but it encompasses also this function of the immune system. The immune dysfunction, according to our understanding, is not the primary cause of the disease, but it's a cat catalyzer. We are suggesting rejuvenating the immune system and as a way of the restoring the communication. Now, what we learned that the, need, the antibody is a short lived and we don't need it for a long time. We learned that we don't need the effect or function, uh, our FCC effect or function. And therefore, we consider that if we modify the FC portion of the antibody by point mutation and remove the FC cytotoxic activity and shorter the half life of the antibody, it will still be active. And we will reduce the side effect that, our, um, that we know from cancer immunotherapy that could result for checkpoint uh, because of some autoimmune manifestation. So basically, that's what we did. We verified that the antibody maintained is a, a affinity in, vit, uh, in vitro. We checked the modifica modification of some antibody uh, that cross-react with the human in the same way that we modified our human antibody. And we found in animal model of diabetes that we reduce uh, dramatically the uh, effect on the propensity to induce autoimmune disease. This is a, a node mice that develops spontaneously diabetes with our antibody, the modified antibody, we don't have almost no spontaneous diabetes. Uh, well, with the, anti, with the native antibody, we have accelerated diabetes. With respect to the efficacy in animal model, we found that we maintain the same effect on cognitive improvement. In animal model, we found that for long time effect, maintain long time effect, we have to dose them every six weeks. 
and the antibody is now, uh, it went through all the regulatory authority, was ready for clinical use. Uh, we are running, uh, the company is running the clinical trial in five centers in UK, five centers in Israel, and one in Amsterdam. And based on the biomarker that we have biomarker for antibody activity, and we have biomarker proxy to the mechanism of action that we can monitor in the blood and in the CSF. So for the student in the audience, after 26 of struggling against the dogma, I just want to point out that Nature Neuroscience is celebrating now uh, 20, 10, 25 years anniversary, and they decided every month uh, to select one topic and the individual that affected the topic. So the first topic was neuroimmunity, and this was a real, really transi transition in the view uh, among the neuroscientists. And the fair, the, for the uh, uh, neuroimmunity, they selected our work. So as I started, when Aske asked me the question, keep on going against the dogma, but it's your responsibility to prove it. And finally, uh, all my work was supported by competitive grants, um, uh, the ERC, uh, also uh, at the two ERC, and uh, one in additional one is a synergy ERC, and that I was co-coordinator, and the clinical trial is heavily supported by the National Institute of Aging and by um, Bill Gates Foundation. And these are current student and postdoc in my laboratory. In spite of the situation in Israel, many of them came back after they left at the beginning of the war. Much of the work in collaboration, the single cells in collaboration with Ido Amit at the Weizmann Institute and Nomi Khabib at the Hebrew University and many other collaborators. And before finishing, I would like to credit many, many former graduate students because during these 25 years, many students passed by my lab, including uh, Asia Rolls, and they are doing amazingly, and they are themselves now doing amazing work, and they are leader by themselves. So thank you very much. Thank you very much, Michal. It's been a pleasure listening to your talk and uh, seeing all the progress that has been made, and uh, I think the the transition from a crazy idea to something that can potentially really help with one of our biggest challenges, like Alzheimer, is really inspiring. So um, I would like to, as as you know, in the spirit of this uh, program, we are having a you can ask questions or X. You just need to search for account Global Immunotox and uh, find the tweet that says, ask a question for Michal Schwartz. You also have it in the chat webinar and she will rep reply to you uh, over X. So you can continue the conversation online and I hope it will stimulate your thoughts and your communication on this matter. And uh, we are looking forward to the next talk, uh, talks that are about to come in this Global Immunotalks. And I'm wishing you a wonderful year and uh, hope it will be a good one. So thank you very much. Thank you, Asya. Thank it you was very a pleasure much. for me as well.